Okay, so uh, welcome to my office. It's Monday morning. We had a slight failure on the recording on Sunday morning, so I'm going to re-record my sermon uh, for us now. I'm going to put up, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to put up the PowerPoint slides over the top so you can get an idea of uh, those slides as well. But let me pray as we begin. Holy Father, I want to pray that even in this re-recording of the sermon that you might be uh, present, that you might help us. Uh, we do thank you for your word and I pray for those listening uh, that you would use uh, these your words to encourage us and to help us in Jesus name. Amen. Well, it really is a mammoth passage, 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 to 3, verse 39. But it is one story covering a period of about two years during which Abner and Saul's son Ishbosheth fight a civil war with David and his commander Joab. Uh, most of the action takes place as the two sides meet in a place called Gibeon, which is a short distance from Hebron, where David is based, and a longer trip for Abner and his men, if you remember from last week, are up in a place called Mahanaim. Now, I'm not going to walk through all of the verses in detail, but as I said, they do make up one big story, which has three main characters. And we're going to spend our time looking at those three characters, Abner, Joab and David, and see what they've got to say to us this morning. So let's start with Abner. I don't know how you imagine Abner. This is what Wikipedia thinks he looks like, the guy in green shown in a medieval Bible. I guess that probably wasn't what he looked like. He seems to have an impossibly thin waist and he's wearing armour over his mouth while speaking to the king, which I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have done either. But whatever he might have looked like, we found him last week to be a stubborn and proud man who for some reason didn't want to give up the fight, even though it was clearly lost. Now, you know, his King Saul was dead. He'd lost lots of his army. He had lost many battles. But what we learned this week is that for all Abner's stubbornness, uh, we mustn't think of him as a stupid man. In fact, as you walk through the story, you notice that the verb most often used of Abner in our passage this morning is the verb said, to say. Now, that might sound a bit boring, but the point is that pretty much every time you encounter Abner in the Civil War, he's not fighting, but he's talking, speaking, particularly trying to negotiate his way out of trouble, trying to come to terms of peace with people, which I think gives us a, a, a window into Abner's cunning. Abner in the story is a guy with a plan and great skill in making it happen. Let me try and show you what I mean with a few of these stories. At the first scene in our passage this morning takes place in the Pool of Gibeon where instead of a full-blown war, Ab Abner suggests a cunning plan. Uh, look at chapter 2, verse 14. What does he say? He says, Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Abner's plan here is that 12 men from each side fight out to the death as representatives of the nation, so the rest of them don't have to get involved. Now, it might have been a clever idea, but it doesn't work because... Uh, unexpectedly, the 12 fights finish with no winner in any of them, each of them killing the other in exactly the same way and at exactly the same time. And besides that, a big battle follows anyway, a battle which, according to verse 17, Abner and his men lose. In the next scene, you find Abner running from a guy called Ashel, who's trying to kill him. Now, Ashel is Joab's brother, and he's chasing Abner, the main man, I think, assuming that if he can kill Abner, then the war will be over. Now, Abner knows he's in trouble. Ashrael is a famous runner. And while Ashrael doesn't appear to be carrying any weapons, I think that's the point of, you know, telling him to go and get the spoil so he can get some weapons to fight properly. So Ashrael is not weighed down by any weapons while Abner is fully loaded with his. You know, this would be like Usain Bolt chasing you in running gear while you're wearing your school shoes and carrying a heavy bag. You know he's going to catch you. You're not going to get away. And Abner knows that, so instead he tries to wheedle his way out with his words, calling out and trying to persuade Ashel to give up the chase, saying, turn aside from chasing me. Abner knows, doesn't he, that killing Ashel would be a bad move because that would make Joab hate him even more. You don't want to make him an enemy of Joab. But still, Ashel won't listen to his words and he ends up being killed by Abner, who it appears is trying to stop him with the blunt end of his spear, which freakily goes all the way through the running Ashel, who is obviously running a lot faster than Abner thought. Moving on the story, and Abner speaking again, negotiating verse 26 to Joab to persuade his army to stop pursuing the Israelites who they've beaten in battle. He says, give up 
because if you don't, the end will be bitter. Uh, the final words to notice are with King Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth, if you remember, is Saul's son, who Abner has made as an alternative king to King David. Importantly, if you look at chapter 3, verse 6, it tells you that Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. I think what's going on here is that Abner is increasingly powerful and Ishbosheth is is threatened by that. So he accuses him of making a bid for the role of king by taking one of Saul's concubines as his own. Whether or not the accusation is true, we don't know, but Abner is mad at the accusation and tells Ishbosheth that he's changing sides. Look at what he says in verse 9. I will make David king. Now, we could say more about Abner, but the point I think to notice is that Abner is always speaking and negotiating. He's always working on his clever ideas and trying to persuade others to agree. He even incredibly thinks that it's within his power to make David king. But at the end of the story, Abner's dead, murdered by Joab and Abishai in revenge for Asheel's life. Now, notice that when David sings about Abner, he calls him in verse 38, a great man. Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel, he says in verse 38. But all the same, he's died a fool's death, verse 33. And so the end was bitter for him. Now, the chapter here is full of chaos, battles, duels, wars, murders even. It's a mess. And in the midst of all of that, Abner oozes self-confidence thinking that it's possible for him, despite everything that's going on, it's possible for him, by the cunning of his words, to get exactly what he wants in life. But in the end, he's wrong. Now, I think if we're honest, there's not a person who wouldn't like to be a bit more like Abner. You know, we we dream of that kind of self-confidence, don't we? To be that full of wise ideas, skilled at negotiating. You know, Abner's the, the lad at school who never does his homework, but always seems to get away with it. Who doesn't want to be that guy? He's like the guy at work who runs the business, he's making lots of money, never seems to be working very hard. He's the voice of reason in family arguments. He's the guy who always seems to land on his feet. And in a way, there's not that much wrong with what Abner says in the story. Asher would have done better off if he'd listened to Abner. The point of the story is not Abner's ideas are all immoral and rubbish. No, that's not it. Rather, the point is that for all his wisdom, he dies a fool's death. Why? Well, because as much as we'd love that kind of self-confidence, it doesn't matter how much of it you have, the world is cruel and chaotic, and even the wisest and the shrewdest Abner dies a fool's death in the end. He had it all going for him, and it wasn't enough. And whether you proudly think you're like him, or whether we wallow in self-pity because we'd like to be more like him, What the story screams out to us is that in the end, human words come to nothing and it will be bitter in the end. Next and more quickly, let's look at Joab. Here's Joab in his Lego character. And if you're in family Sunday school, we looked all through the story with the Lego characters. In contrast to Abner, every time we meet Joab in the Civil War, he's being a thug or at least a strong man, maybe a warrior. Uh, The passage variously describes him as pursuing the enemy, blowing the battle trumpet, bringing back the spoils of war, striking people and killing people. If you look down at chapter 3 verse 22, you get an idea of how Joab works. Joab here has returned from a raid on enemy territory and that itself is so normal that the narrator doesn't even tell us where that was or why he went. Only adds that he brought back loads of spoil with him, he clearly won. Now, when Joab arrives back in Hebron, he's told about David meeting with Abner and that David has sent Abner away in peace. And Joab is not impressed. Listen to what he says in verse 24. Then Joab went to the king and said, what have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away so that he is gone? You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. Joab thinks that David has lost the plot. David, are you losing your mind? Do you not understand how the world works, says Joab? Abner has come to spy on you so that he can defeat you. You don't win at life, David, by letting your enemies play tricks on you. So Joab takes things into his own hands and calls Abner back to Hebron and murders him. 
There's an interesting twist in the story here in that Hebron itself was one of the cities of refuge that Joshua set up. Cities of refuge were distributed across the land as places for people to run to to find protection from avengers of blood. So that if you'd killed someone by accident, you could run to one of these places and live in peace, knowing that the avengers of blood would not be able to touch you there. Now in the story, Joab calls Abner back into the city of refuge and kills him in revenge for his brother, who Abner killed in war, seemingly accidentally, with the butt of his spear in self-defence. Which I think explains why David is so mad with Joab as he curses him in verse 29 and all of his family. A curse which eventually gets carried out by David's son Solomon, who puts Joab to death for this murder and for another murder that we're going to see in weeks to come. Now contrast with me, Abner and Joab. Both very different in their approaches, one of cunning, shrewd, wise words and the other one a muscle man, thug. But in the end, Neither of them work. Our world is still full of thugs, isn't it? Maybe you're one. I mean, not like Joab, you know, we're not going to slip the dagger in into unsuspecting enemies, but maybe we uh, shout and yell at our parents or our children to get them to do what we want them to do. Perhaps we lie and cheat at work. Perhaps we put the verbal knife in behind people's backs, using the all means necessary to push ourselves forward and to get our own way. Maybe that just sounds too brutal. We're not that kind of uh, person, maybe. But actually, instead, like Joab, we cling on to bitterness and revenge, harbouring ideas of paying people back for past wrongs. Maybe we just never follow through, even though we'd love to. Well, Joab is here in the story to tell you that that approach to life doesn't work. If our confidence for the future is founded on our own strength and actions, we're doomed. And it's only a matter of time. Which leaves us with the final character to consider this morning, which is David. David. This is what a 15th century painter thought David looked like. And he's wearing a bucket hat. He's clearly a man ahead of the fashion curve. But fashionable or not, the writer wants us to notice about David something rather extraordinary. The, the verbs used of David in the passage are things like wept, lifted up his voice. Not as in shouted out, but as in cried out in sadness. He lamented. Then in verse 39, David summarises his actions for us. Let me read verse 39 to you. And I was gentle today, though anointed king. These men, the sons of Zariah, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Now, this is really the whole point of the story. And it's surprising. You think about it. What was the big problem in these chapters? Civil war. Two kings, one nation. And the story tells us of the failure of Abner's words and of Joab's strength to solve this big problem. Neither of them succeed in uniting the kingdom under David, despite the fact that that's what they're trying to do. And despite the fact that you'd be hard pressed in history to find a tougher man than Joab or a more shrewd politician than Abner. But both of them come to nothing in the end. But then at the end of the story, Israel, the part belonging to Ishbosheth, are pleased with King David. Verse 36, we're told twice in quick succession, just to make sure that we don't miss it, that those people are pleased with David. How does that happen? How does David achieve what Abner's words and Joab's strength were unable to achieve? Answer, verse 39, he achieves it through gentleness. Now, that's striking. But the point is not so much that we should be gentle if we want to get ahead in life, although gentleness does have a lot to commend it. Gentleness is a great parenting tool. Gentleness is a great way to treat staff at work. It's a great way to make lasting friendships at school and youth group. All of us could do with learning a bit more gentleness. But the point of the story is not really so much try hard to be a bit more like David. Rather, the gentleness of King David is like an arrow pointing us forward to a truly gentle king. One of the struggles I think that we have with these stories in the Bible is that they feel so different to anything that we experience. It's it's almost like a different world as we read it. But if we slow down a bit and think about it, while we might not be living in the midst of an ancient civil war, the fact remains that our world is still chaotic. And so are our lives. And the big battle that we have, which 
is the big battle that David really has, and it runs all the way through the Bible, is the battle with sin. That we're at civil war with God. You know, two claims for the kingdom, one kingdom. And we're wrestling for control of our lives, wanting to live our own way. And the question is, what can end that war? Where will the decisive battle be? Where will the hostilities between us and God be ended, where we could be joyfully brought back to him so that we're pleased with him like the Israelites are pleased with David? Well, it's not in our wheedling words, is it? We can't talk our way out of those hostilities. We, we can't say enough prayers. We can't recite enough creeds. We can't say enough right things. Nor will our brutal strength solve it. You know, we can't fight our way to peace with God. We can't earn our way to peace with God. Instead, the decisive victory will be where? In the gentleness of the anointed king. Not as he weeps over the death of his enemy, but as he dies in the place of his enemies on the cross. Jumping forward to Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus' point is that we should stop relying on our own pretend strength and come to him like children, finding that his gentleness is stronger. Now, there's lots that we could say about this, but I think the big point of the passage is how this gentleness draws us in. So in 2 Samuel 3, the people see the tears of King David, listen to his lament and are drawn towards him, seeing in him someone that they can trust and follow. And so with Jesus, you know, the world is a really harsh place, a place that will shout at you, that will uh, tell you to work harder, to be better. But Jesus is gentle dies for your sin. You know, the world says it belongs to the strong and the beautiful, the powerful and impressive. But they abuse the weak and tread on the poor, but Jesus is gentle, dying for the bruised reed and the faintly burning wick, sweating blood at our sin and dying in our place and rising to victory, drawing us in with his beautiful gentleness. See, think about the story like this. Imagine you're an Israelite, you know, you've been pushed and pulled by the events of the day. You know, your, your brothers and your father has been killed in a battle. You know, Abner's been after you to draft you into his army. But then you hear of this King David, the gentle king singing and weeping over the death of his enemy. And what do you think in the midst of all that's going on? Well, you'd, surely you think, get me to that kingdom. I want to be with that king. Well, so too for us this morning. 2 Samuel 3 paints a picture of a gentle King Jesus whose powerful gentleness brings peace and reconciliation with God that we could only dream of. And he invites us, draws us, calls us to come and join his kingdom. You know, leave behind the brutality of your own clever words. Stop trusting in your own strength or the strength of others. Uh, leave behind the cruel chaos of the world and come to the gentle saviour who lovingly reaches out to you. This is so hard, isn't it, for us to hold on to in the Christian life. It's so easy to focus on our own feelings, our own understanding, even the ups and downs of our own lives, and to forget that actually the heart of the Christian life is not so much about us, but about Christ, a beautiful, gentle saviour who is outstanding in the world because nobody has gentleness like him. And he calls us this morning to come to him, to trust in him, and to live our lives in his beautiful kingdom.